Hello and welcome to the Plain Spoken Podcast. Uh, this episode's a little bit different in that I was asked to be a guest on Dan Dominguez's podcast, who was a guest of mine as well on, on Plain Spoken, a friend that I've had the, the privilege to get to know over the last uh, probably six months or so through another dear friend named Nikki. Uh, he had me on his uh, Why Not Lead Different podcast. I actually think the podcast name is Lead Different. Uh, and he does far more episodes than I do. He's got a great set of guests that come on and it's a little bit shorter form factor, about a half hour, but I had a tremendous amount of fun speaking to Dan on the topics that are near and dear to my heart, as well as talking about something near and dear to his heart, which is the YOS or operating system, which is based on Simon Sinek's uh, How to Find Your Why. So I hope you enjoy the interview and we'll be back with another uh, standard plain spoken episode uh, in, a, in a, probably about a week. So uh, let me know what you think, and as always, enjoy. Welcome to Lead Different, the podcast that redefines leadership and challenges the status quo. Hosted by Daniel Dominguez, founder and CEO of Why Not Leadership, this show is your compass to becoming a better leader through the power of self-awareness. Good leaders foster teams that are engaged, empowered, and energized. Join us on this transformative journey as we equip you with the tools and insights to lead different. Get ready to challenge the ordinary and embrace self-aware leadership. This is Lead Different. Subscribe now. Discover a new era of leadership. Lead Different, because great leaders change the world. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Lead Different Podcast. I'm excited to introduce you to our guest today, Derek Fournier. Let me tell you a little bit about Derek. He is a respected business strategist and product innovator with an impressive career positioning business for exponential businesses for exponential growth and market dominance. His background combines business and technical leadership roles in highly complex global environments with multiple high-level stakeholders. Derek innovated robust product and customer solutions that solve customer pain points at scale, advance business value, and drive operational efficiency. He's a trusted advisor to C-suite and boards of directors. He's also the founder and principal of Plain Sight Strategy Group. Derek advises a diversity of companies on leadership development, technology, optimization, and business transformation. He has developed and implemented high-performance product and customer solutions for 53 of the Fortune 100. That is a high, high, high recommendation. How are you today, Derek? I am fantastic, Dan. It's great to be here with you. Thank you for the uh, introduction. Man, thank you for being here, Derek. You know, our, our paths cross through Nikki uh, Ortiz, who uh, is a member of my team on the Why Not Leadership team, but she's a member of your team. You guys are both Tampa Bay Bucks big fans. Yes, we are, uh, which means we we can endure a tremendous amount of pain. Uh, you have to as a Bucks fan, but recently it's been more pleasure. So we're we're happy to ride that upswing. Well, I want to I want to say uh, you know give a shout out to Nikki for number one, she's an amazing member of my team, and she makes the wheels turn at at Why Not Leadership, and uh, and she she uh, introduced us. I had an opportunity to be on your podcast. You have a tremendous show, and you share a lot of great knowledge. Uh, I, I was so impressed with it, Derek, and I was so impressed with you. It's so it's you know often uh, we get introduced to people with come with big introductions. We had a great introduction for you on this show, and then the the person actually you know sometimes it's a little bit of a letdown when you actually meet them. You actually exceeded expectations, so thank you for doing that. Thank you for being who you are, and thank you for being on the Lead Different podcast. Well, I appreciate the kind words, and thanks for having me. It's always great to you know when Nikki introduced us. The thought was we have some areas of similar. Uh, attention, interests, yeah. uh, potentially skills, capabilities, knowledge, et cetera. And, but we have very different uh, universes in which we travel. Uh, so anytime you can, you can span that, it's, it's, a, it's a win. So I'm, I'm happy to be here and look forward to the conversation. One of the, the neat things, one of the things I love doing, Derek, is finding people who are really good at the things I'm not good at, right? I, I, my, my thing, I mean, we're called Why Not Leadership for a different, for a reason. We say lead different for a reason. Where I, well, the people I want to work with are leaders who want to lead differently, who want to do something different so they can understand their teams better. I help people connect better. But when it comes to business strategy, when it comes to the things that you're really strong at, I leave that to the experts. So it's really cool to have you on because 
If you're tuning into the Lead Different podcast, you're tuning in to hear about different leadership strategies. Now, Derek, you've led at a high level in a lot of different places, and you've advised and developed and implemented solutions for 53 of the Fortune 100. I can imagine uh, there's a there's a lot of uh, success stories there. What's your what's your biggest win you've had in terms of creating a product or a solution that was different and out of the box uh, that that our our listeners would say, hey, that's really great. I'm I'm glad to hear about that story. You know, it's it's interesting. I uh, I think there's probably two that come to mind. Uh, I'll tell the oldest one first, so we'll go in uh, in sequence order. When I was at Microsoft, I was working on a product that it was universally reviled uh, called Systems Management Server. And my my dear friend Bill Anderson was on my podcast, and and he reca- recounted this story. Uh, at the time, just pre Y two K, that sends us back almost a quarter of a century now. Right. Uh, we were trying to get the product out, and and like I said, everyone up to and including Bill Gates hated this product. Uh, and as software products often do, it was rushed across the finish line, and it had tons of bugs, and and it caused a tremendous amount of pain. And I was very young in my software development career at that point, but I realized one of the problems was we really didn't talk much to our customers. We just sort of imposed on our customers. This is what you should have. Here's what you want. Instead of saying, what do you need? And so we tried to start to create a customer feedback process. Uh, And back in the early days, this was called a joint development program. And it was initially launched with Windows 2000, again, showing how far back this goes. Uh, but, But we leveraged it too for our service release. And we really kind of rebounded that product with Service Pack 2. We didn't get it first with the first Service Pack. We were three bugs short of really trying to you know, take the, the stain off of that product. But with Service Pack 2, we finally got to a product that people really liked. Now, why am I giving you all of this preamble? It sounds very boring for people who aren't into software, especially esoteric back office software. Well, that product in the Microsoft back office was about a $250 million product. Right, which is not big in the back office of Microsoft. What a great problem to have, right? We then embarked on a change to a product that would be called SMS 2003 that has subsequently become System Center Configuration Manager, which is part of the System Center suite. And because of the hard work that we did, and some of it was was borderline, you know, taking chances, not with our clients, but internally, politics and fighting, you know, bad decisions. It's now over a billion dollar product. Uh, it, it has truly transformed uh, device management and security management in the Windows space and beyond. And it was done because we got a group of people together who were passionate, who were focused, who were skilled, who trusted each other. And we were able to to move the barge that was Microsoft, which a lot of times people think is impossible. Uh, that's that's the first story. Well, tell hey, look, I'm I'm I want I want to dig into this one, and then I want to get into the second story because one of the things that 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 I have all our guests do, and you were you were kind enough to do this, uh, Derek. Actually, you did it with Nikki. Is take the Y operating system discovery, and we did yours, and it came up in the story. Your why is to to build relationships based on trust. Your how is to make things simple and easy to understand, and your what is to deliver solutions that are out of the box and different to challenge the status quo. And I heard all of that in that story, but it was really important. You talked about a team that trusted itself. It sounds that seems to be a theme. uh, And then you simplified it, right? You said, hey, look, this is the things we need to do. And you provided a solution that was completely different. Uh, Tell me how you build trust when you've got, I mean, that, that is a monster organization, right? You've got a competing interest. You've got competing egos, competing departments. How did you bring everyone together so that they trusted each other and went forward with this project, which was, and I like you, I love what you said, you know, you, you forexed the revenue uh, on, a, on a product by creating it and doing something that they hadn't thought of, which is, hey, how about we talk to the customer? Let's figure out what they want and let's customize the product. So tell us how you, how you did that. How did you build that trust, simplify it, and then bring something different to it? You know, it's interesting. The way I did it there is not how I would do it now, which is, I think, really an interesting story that we can delve into if you want to. But uh, but I did it through just hard work and and effort. And that, that sounds like a trite answer, but I got there and I didn't have software development pedigree. I had operational experience as an IT person, but I also was willing to work longer and harder than most folks. Now, that's in a place that workaholics were actually, you know, incredibly revered. People had couches in their office. It was insane what we were doing at the time, but we were willing to 
always go further. I remember during there was a particular uh, virus outbreak. And I can't remember the name, but it was a SQL injection issue. But I got a call on a Thursday night from my lead and we rallied a group of about 12 people across organizations and we released what was called the Microsoft Security Toolkit, which was a, a patch management solution. We did it over the weekend to try and abate this problem. But I had one of my colleagues who sadly is not with us anymore. He was at the ballet in a full tux and he left the ballet in his full tux to come in and work with us. And so when everyone knew that all of us were willing to do whatever it took, uh, no one's beyond grabbing the shovel and digging the hole, right? We never ask one of our teammates to do something we weren't willing to do. We just all needed to get the job done. That's how we really kind of started to build. And, and the other part was uh, vulnerability. And I didn't realize it then. I didn't use the word vulnerability. I do now. And I lead more with that probably than with the whole work 120 hours. I think that's a bit perverse. But being willing to acknowledge when you have a problem, when you when there is a gap, to your point, the things you don't do well and try and find someone who that's their superpower, right? And and lean into that while you learn. Don't try and replace them because that you've already got someone who's great at it. And that's that's really what we did. We built a a tight, cohesive group within a much larger group. And that spreads like a positive virus. When you have a group of 10 within a larger group of 200 who always can work together, who trust each other, who get things done, it spreads because people want to be part of a team like that. You know, great. You know, there's a couple of things, man. You said a couple, you, this is great because you're, 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 you're a question prompter as you're telling the story. You mentioned always go further and you were willing to work harder than everybody else in an environment where everybody was working harder than everybody else. Right. But you also talked about, you know, you had a group of 10 and with the why of trust. This is what I have found, Derek. People with the why of trust tend to have small circles. Right. There might have been a group of 200, but you had a group of 10 inside that group of 200. And that was a group that knew you were thick as thieves. You knew you could count on each other. You knew that if you needed somebody that was at the ballet on a Friday night, they were going to leave the ballet and come and take care of business if you needed them. Uh, that, that's a special kind of bond that's built on relationships where you guys really trusted each other and understood that the mission was bigger. So. Let, let, let me take that another direction, though, because one of the things that's that's big and you talk about vulnerability, which is a buzzword, right? Everybody talks about, hey, be vulnerable. It's, and it's important. I think it's they're a leader who's willing to be vulnerable is going to connect better with their teams and is going to build the kind of trust that you guys had built so that you guys could do things that were unimaginable. But uh, when we talk about that workaholic environment, and this is the early 2000s where people were, you know, 160 hours was considered like, hey, you're you're ba barely scratching the surface of what you can do. <laughs> Get that couch in your office. Um, how does that mesh with today's life work balance and the, and what we're all trying to achieve and, and understand that, hey, there's more to life than work and there are more important things than, than getting the project done but also getting results. Tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about that environment. You know, it's it's interesting because as I got older, and I don't think it was actually a byproduct of age. Uh, it was actually a book that I read. It's actually over here. It doesn't have to be crazy at work by uh, uh, Jason Fried and David Hennemeyer Henson from Thirty Seven Signals. Which, if your listeners haven't read that book, I recommend that and rework. They do a great job. It was like they were watching me and my colleague Jim as we grew up, right? We would say, oh, listen, it's always family first. And we meant it. Like, we genuinely meant it. it. We genuinely meant you should take the vacation. You should take care of your kids. You should do those things that are important. If you need a mental health day, take a mental health day. But all the while, we never did it ourselves. Mm. And so we were not modeling the behavior that we were trying to make sure was part of our company culture. And so it came across as half-hearted. So people still saw us when we were going into an office, being the first car in and the last one out. They saw us emailing at two in the morning. And so out of our mouth came, don't do that. And out of our actions came, do that. And, and so I think that it, is, it becomes imperative to realize, and I used to, to call myself a spurt worker, right? I was a sprinter. And I was a, funny enough, I don't look like much of an athlete, but I used to be a pretty decent athlete. And I was always a sprint athlete. I was never an endurance athlete. But I think that any race can be done in, in a bunch of sprints. And, you know, you can draw that analogy to agile software development or whatever you want to do. But there are times where we have to work the 100-hour weeks. Mm. They don't have to be every week. So know when it is required to step on the gas and, and other people will rally around you. Also know when it's time to pass the baton and say, listen, I got to tap out. 
I, whether it's sleep or whether it's mental health or whether it's whatever it is, you have to know yourself and others have to know you enough to say, listen, you're not giving your best, right? Let's let's get you recharged. And that's when I talk about vulnerability, that's what I'm, ta- I'm not talking about crying in front of people and all that, which is fine and expressing yourself. Those are all important, but really it's about being authentic. And, and I think that's the part of vulnerability that I'm trying to lean in on in, in my life, whether it be work or personal, is try to be authentic as often as possible, right? Because uh, first of all, it's easier. Uh, it's, it's easier. Uh, I always joke with my, my kids. I'm like, don't lie. Lying is a probability game. You're going to be wrong some number of times. Don't waste a lie on something stupid, right? You may have to lie to not hurt your dad's feelings or your mom's feelings, and those are different. So I think authenticity is really at the core of, uh, core of the vulnerability piece that I was talking about. And you're, talk, you're talking my language, and, and authenticity is absolutely so important. And I can see where uh, that that – and I've been in those types of environments where we're saying, don't do this, but then we do it ourselves, right? So as yep. leaders, we have to be authentic. But I, I like what you said about the sprints. You know, I learned about sprints probably in the, in the last four years. <coughs> it's something that I need to do because – I can't sit for more than 45, 50 minutes at a time working on anything. In the in the software world, you you probably sit for hours and and you're developing and you're coding and you're creating. I, I can probably do 45 minutes and then I have to stand up and just move around. But I've learned to put those sprints together. And boy, it's amazing how much you can get done if you put 10, 45 minute sprints together in a day or four or five, 45 minute sprints. I, I've realized, that, hey, I'm good for about six hours a day. I'm really good for about six hours. And then I need to go do something else, something different. I need to be outside. I need to vary my routine. Otherwise, I get bored. But you guys were able to get a lot done. What's a sprint like for Derek? Well, it's it's interesting. Uh, and I actually, I grabbed my phone because there was a podcast I just listened to uh, <laughs> uh, from Sam Harris's Making Sense podcast with uh, a gentleman. What's Who's the guest? Sorry, Cal Newport. It's talking about knowledge work. And knowledge work is really tough because – it's not like you're swinging a hammer or screwing in screws or doing things that the you know industrial revolution taught us about work. You're you're producing uh, intellectual property in many regards or in many cases. And so, if I can do something in an hour that it might take someone else ten hours to do, which is better? Well, from an efficiency perspective, one hour is better, right? But that just means that I've got nine hours. That I've got to now air quotes fill in order to look like I'm as productive as the person who's taking ten hours. And so it, it's. It's like we've got this hourly concept, and that's something we've got to get out of. And so for me, sprints become – the hardest part about sprints become realizing that your downtime is not down. It is imperative to get that not sprinting time. It's recovery time. It's It allows your brain to relax. Now, you do something great that I would like to implement. I would love to get up every 45 minutes, go out to my home gym, hop on the rower, walk around the neighborhood, whatever, right? It's, It's just better for you. And in fact, Jason Fried in in Rework, I think it was, talks about from a design perspective, walking in nature is great because you've got millions of years of adaptation in front of you, right? And you can see those things and maybe transfer those into the things you work on and you can become inspired by it. I'm not telling you to go out there and smell the flowers and chase the butterflies, (laughs) though you're welcome to do that. But go out there, get that vitamin D production going on and and take the break. I I am crap at that. Uh, I will grind and grind and grind and grind and grind. And to be honest, this is one of the things I needed to change during that Microsoft security toolkit thing that I referenced. Um, I worked, I think 30 hours contiguous, right. And made fun of my guys that I was close to for having to go home and take a shower because it was a very machismo driven, right. Uh, type a driver, driver, driver mentality. I look back on that with horror, right. I should never have done it nor should I have made fun of them. Now, we were close, and, and they took it as a, the chiding that it was intended as. Um, but now it's more about trying to figure out how to do, do these sprints and, and realize when you're at your, your peak and when you're not and be willing to take those breaks and say, you know what? I, I don't have it right now. You know, I love what you said, you know, because one of the things that I, that I concentrate on, and, I'm, and, 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 and when we create our companies, we create a culture. And so why not leadership? We believe in, in getting results. Let's just get results. And like you said, if something takes you an hour to do and we're not going to penalize you and make you work another 10 because it was expected to take 10 hours. Right. Hey, here's what here's what the outcome is. You got to that outcome on Monday and you don't have another project. Go take some time for yourself. Uh, You know, family's important. Right. You know, so if we have uh, uh, somebody who's got young kids and we've got something to do and 
I just look at the schedule. And you know what? We have an open calendar policy. We say, you know what? Put it on your calendar. My personal stuff, my my uh, my my golf with my dad, my coaching my daughter's track and cross country team, because you got to put the big rocks in first. If you don't put them in, you know, as, as they say, you, are you going to are you going to work to live or live to work? Right. right. I work to live. Right. And so I want to go ahead and do that. So a lot of things you just said that that were really good. So thank you for making me feel good. Be, what I did, I just did a workshop, a one and a half hour workshop with 30 business leaders in Spain, Derek. And in between that and talking to you, I went outside. I live on a small farm and I fed the sheep. Which was nice. Hey, I got outside, got some vitamin D, fed the sheep and uh, petted my dog, came back in. I have the energy to work with you for the for 45 minutes. So thank you for that. Uh, really cool. Uh, I think what, what you did, just did is you, you made me feel good about what I'm already doing. And it's why you're successful, Derek. Tell us about that second story, because you told us the first story. So let's tell let's get to that second story. I'm sure it's full of stuff that we want to hear about. Yeah, the second story, uh, there's a painful uh epilogue to it as it was the end of the company I was working on uh, before going back and rebooting Plainside Strategy Group. But we were in the cruise industry and the the idea was to transform the cruise industry with a suite of applications or a platform. And Virgin Voyages was launching their new cruise line. And we partnered up to build a platform that had never been built before that would allow a level of service and immersion that had just never been seen. Now, this is something that other companies have tried to do and failed. And uh, a small company out of Orlando uh, never was given the, the chance to succeed. And to be honest, we released during COVID, right? The cruise industry went through something it had never gone through before, which was ships not sailing. And so in and amidst all of this, a global pandemic, people literally dying. We had a number of family members from our company pass away uh, as we were a multinational company. We had to pivot the company during that process away from cruise because ships weren't sailing. But as we came out the back end and we continued to tweak this massive platform, uh, what we found out was we had built a transformational platform that would literally change the industry. Uh, and while all of us who were at the two foot level, you know, it's quite often when you create, all you see are the, the warts, right? You see all the things you fell short of, you, you know where your goals were and where you ended up and the compromises that had to be made along the way in order to get to production and 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 only with the benefit of time and perspective, and sometimes uh, external perspective is incredibly valuable there, do you realize what a change you made and, and what a difference that the platform you released created? And, and we're still seeing that now as Version continues to, to go forth with that platform and do great things. Um, and that was a multinational team, like I said, where uh, we, we really had to handle tremendous amounts of hardware and, and clients and customer needs and there's always this perception of what's broken versus what's working. And it was a massive undertaking. And I'm incredibly proud of the work that our team was able to do. Um, and not super excited about how it all ended. And that's a topic for another day. But the actual product and the the experiences crossing the Atlantic multiple times, testing and deploying and implementing and, and watching cruisers' faces light up when they could shake their phone and have champagne magically find them on the ship was was absolutely one of the thrills of my lifetime from a business perspective. Man, that sounds like uh, the old uh, in the old days. Uh, it was Ritz Carlton. Carlton was was mm -hmm. known for that just sp very good service. But they had this was way before the technology age that we're talking about. So you've created some of that uh, that experience for cruisers, and and congratulations on on the success of that project, Eric. Uh, I can see where that 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 made a difference. I can I, in hearing you tell the story, I can see the excitement in your voice. Because I can see that that was a very, very successful project that made a big difference. So now that you're leading Plainsight Strategy Group and you, you have a mission to drive profitability, operational efficiency, and lean forward, you know, into, into the current tech challenges, what, what is it that, that's driving Plainsight Strategy today? You know, it's interesting. Uh, this was you, when we chatted before the show, you asked how I was doing. And I said, moments of brilliance and moments of despair, like my friend describes his golf game. And one of the things with Plainsight was it was the reboot because I had started this like 14 years ago and then I landed a client that became a dear personal friend and I stayed with his company. And, and I, while I kept Plainsight alive, uh, I wasn't actively looking for other clients. So it was really a place for me to, to blog and, and communicate. Well, when that company went away and I am rebooting it, I, I was focusing on the what, what are we going to do? We had now had experience with private equity 
and you know tremendous opportunities for growth. We certainly had technology experience. Uh, what was the area where we could provide the most value and, and make a difference, really? And and to be honest, I struggled with that. I struggled mightily with it because you end up being in an also ran race with a lot of other people with similar experience and. And really, it's it's not Coke and Pepsi. It's Coke and Coke and Coke and Coke and Coke. And that's not interesting. And I, I tried to focus on what's the thing that gets me up in the morning. And what it is, is working with people that I trust and love and respect and admire and, and want to go do cool things with. And I know that cool things is not a very business savvy way to describe it. But the reality is the what that I do and that my team does, whether it's in Plain Sight Strategy Group or in our software division, Plain Software, the what can be interesting, but there's lots of people that do that. The mm-hmm. who I do it with is different because we're a group. That 10 that goes back to the original story, I've got a core group of people that I have an immense amount of trust, respect, admiration, and love for, and we know how each other work. We are not going to be the people that come in and think one size fits all. We are never going out there to try and land 100, 1,000, or 10,000 clients. We're not trying to become the next PricewaterhouseCoopers or BCG. If you are a private equity firm who has a portfolio of companies and you're okay with us really getting a good view of those portfolio companies from an operational perspective and starting with an advisory perspective, maybe growing into consulting and then all the way to partnership if it makes sense, then that's who we are. We are in every sense of the word boutique because we start with only the folks internally who we know have got the experience, but more than that, we've got their trust and their uh, their knowledge and their capabilities uh, that can be brought to bear. So instead of trying to put one Band-Aid on a company, maybe you buy a company and you think maybe, oh, we're going to need to replace the CSO or the CEO maybe because while they're very bright, they don't have the ability to 10x the company, which is why we invested. Rarely is it a point solution that makes a difference because anytime you make a change like that, you disrupt some kind of trust that you may have no concept of. Mm -hmm. And so taking a little bit more time, it's that sort of measure twice, cut once kind of approach. And I'm not even saying that cut is always the right answer. Sometimes it's measure and adjust, measure and educate, measure and modify. And that takes more time up front, but we still think it's going to bring that uh, investment thesis timeline in if you spend that time up front. And that's really what we do. You know, what's really cool is, uh, and we, we talked about it at the beginning of the show, your why is trust. During that 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 quick segment we just did, you you said trust four times. You said you want to work with people you trust, love, respect, and admire, and you want to work on things uh, that are fun. You want to work on those projects. You also talked about building building the trust and, and the fact that changing something can change a trust, right? Absolutely. And, and so how important it is to build that trust with the team. And then you talked about that small team. That, that you have that 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 you uh, that you you you're gonna I, th- I have a feeling Derek that if somebody hires you you're not just gonna come in for a little while it's not a wham bam thank you ma'am it's how can we serve you long term yep yeah it's funny I was talking to my marketing group uh, this morning and uh, I was saying we're not speed daters right that's not what we do um, and there's nothing wrong with that there are tons of companies that do incredibly well they're incredibly lucrative and 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 you know God love them that's not who we want. So in many ways, when we look at how we're going to market plain sight and how we find our clients, they're clients who want a deeper relationship than that because we have to believe in the people that we're working with as well. And, and that doesn't mean that these folks that we don't work with are are nefarious and twisting their mustachios and plotting and scheming the world demise. It just means that that's not the model that we want. And, and it's interesting, especially in VC or private equity, If you don't understand the game that is being played, you don't understand the moves that are being made, right? And you may look at it from the outside and go, why would they possibly recommend this course of action? This makes no sense. Well, you don't understand what their drivers are. Mm -hmm. So until you get unified on what their goals are, what their dreams, aspirations, et cetera, are for that investment, you can't possibly understand the methodology that they're implementing. So so I do know that this is a uh, maybe a, a tougher nut to crack because we're trying to go the way of the boutique uh, agency. But life is too short to do shit you don't like. Oh, sorry. I don't know if it was in the guidelines. You're not supposed to curse on your podcast. Um, maybe you can beep it out. Um, but life's too short to do things you don't like. And, and it's certainly too short to do things with people you don't like. And I, I'm, I'm unwilling to, to trade on either one of those. 
I think you're absolutely right, and I I wholeheartedly agree. I think you we you reach up we reach a point in our lives, and I think we're you and I are of similar age, where we get a chance to choose who we want to work with, and yeah. um you know there's there's you know when I when I in, I've been in business development my entire life and in sales, and so I understand the 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 push to bring in the numbers. But I also understand, and I did this even you know, when I was in, in a high level of leadership with a Fortune 100. Um, there are certain people I want to work with, yep. and and I have this amazing tool that I use with people that that I talk to and I work with, and that gives me a little bit of an idea of whether or not I want to work with them. But then I want to sit down with them and understand what drives you. And like you said, they're not evil people. There are certain people for me. You got to have a certain level of trust. And you got to have a, a certain level of wanting to give back and contribute to the rest of society. And if you've got that, I'll, I'm going to want to work with you. Now, I may not be a fit for you or you may not right. be a fit for me otherwise, but those are the two qualifiers because I want to make a difference. I want to do things that are out of the box and different, and I want to help people make sense of it. I want to help people solve problems. And you do that really well. There's a reason you and I connected so easily, Derek. <laughs> uh, tell me this, because uh, we're you know, can you believe it? We're running out of time. Tell me about the, your, your biggest why not moment. We talked about it in the pre-show. Time in your life that you said why not to something, and you're so glad you did. might have been something that scared you maybe at the time, but our listeners want to hear about that why not moment for you. Uh, it was probably the original founding of Plain Sight Strategy Group. So I had left a company out of uh, Lyle. It's where our geographic paths had mildly converged. I, you, I think you were with Baxter. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so Baxter was a client that that the founder of my company was very close to because apparently when you are in the western suburbs uh, and in the Chicagoland area, you know every other company. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I had left there as CEO. Uh, and I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but I was pretty sure I didn't like working for anybody anymore. But I had I'd grown up watching my father well-intentioned enough, but fail at almost every entrepreneurial venture he had ever embarked on. Grew up uh, very poor by U.S. standards, uh, and I encourage other folks to travel abroad to find out what poor really is. But um, So I was deathly afraid of starting a business and failing. And what I needed to do was take my 401k and cash it out and fund it or go get another gig. And my wife was like, listen, you should just try this and we'll recover. It'll be fine. And uh, so why not was the why not start a company? And I did that. And it's funny because when I reflect on what I did for the call it two years that I struggled trying to land clients, I landed a client here and there. Um, I looked at it as failure for a long time because I didn't explode in growth and all the things you think of when it comes to business. And my wife would look at it and go, well, no, it was immense success. You learned a tremendous amount. You ended up uh, meeting a number of folks, one of whom uh, founded the company that I worked with for the following 13 years, right? Uh, and I had experiences there that I never would have had otherwise. So it was that, that try it on your own thing that I was deathly afraid of. That was the why not moment. You know, what's really cool about that story, uh, Derek, is you, you bring to light, you know, you, you had to have courage, Right. The, the, the antidote for fear is courage, and you had the courage. The other thing that I think you brought up that's really important is you had support. And oh, yeah. from the, probably the most important person in your life, and that's your spouse who said, hey, I believe in you. Go do it. And I think there's there's a certain amount of courage, and, and it's underestimated how much – it how what a positive impact it has when that that life partner says to you, "Hey, I believe in you. Go do it." And you went out, and then you did it, and you're you're making an amazing difference. You're doing amazing work. I want to have you back on, Derek, because I I have a feeling I want to hear some more of those stories. <laughs> but uh, what do you say we end the show on that note? Why not? Ah, uh, look at our man who read the pre-show script. Thank you so much, Derek. <laughs> Everyone, enjoy this interview with Derek. Uh, we're going to see him again here on Why Not Leadership. I have a feeling our paths are going to cross. Now, you're in Florida, right, Derek? Yes, sir, just outside yeah. of Tampa. So I need to get to St. Pete and Tampa, and I think Nikki says I have to go to a Bucks game with you guys. I, I hear that's an amazing experience, so I will do that. Derek, thank you for being on the Lead Different Podcast, and all of you will see you next week. Thanks for having me, Dan. Subscribe now. Discover a new era of leadership. Lead different because great leaders change the world.